Welcome to Intesa San Paolo On Air, an English language insight series jointly hosted by Intesa San Paolo and the University of Oxford, where we embark on global conversations with global leaders. My name is Rupert Younger, and in this episode, we will be discussing the ethics of AI. As a technology that is inserting itself into so many elements of our lives, visible and invisible, this surely is one of the critical questions of our age. What is AI up to today? And are these good things that advance humanity or bad things that threaten us as a species? There's much to discuss. One of the so-called godfathers of artificial intelligence says advances in technology have left him feeling lost. You know, what used to be simple, what gave a meaning to my life and a direction and was clear, isn't anymore. So you could say, I feel lost. AI has hit the headlines all across the world as the immense power of what AI is able to do now starts to become visible. In fact, AI has become so powerful that two of the so-called godfathers of AI have recently given interviews stating concerns about the prodigy that they have helped create. So have we created a monster technology that at some point is going to kill us all? Or are we at the dawn of a new super age for humans where AI releases us from the repetitive, boring parts of our life, freeing us to be our best creative, individual, brilliant and beautifully flawed human selves? I started off by asking AI's newest invention, ChatGPT, for its view. The impact of AI on society and humanity is a complex and debated topic. AI itself is a tool and its potential outcomes depend on how it is developed, deployed, and regulated. It is neither inherently a monster technology destined to kill us all nor a guaranteed liberator from repetitive tasks. AI has the potential to bring about significant advancements and improvements in various areas of life. It can automate routine and mundane tasks, freeing up time and energy for humans to focus on more creative and complex endeavors. By augmenting human capabilities, AI can assist us in solving complex problems, making scientific discoveries, and developing innovative solutions. However, like any powerful technology, AI also presents certain challenges and risks. Ethical concerns such as privacy, bias, and job displacement need to be carefully addressed. There is a need for responsible AI development and robust regulations to ensure that AI is developed and used in a way that aligns with human values, safety, and well-being. The future of AI is uncertain, and its impact will largely depend on how we as a society choose to shape its development and implementation. By fostering a thoughtful and responsible approach, AI has the potential to enhance our lives, empower human creativity, and contribute to the betterment of society. ChatGPT is an impressive piece of technology. I asked it a complex question, and the answer it generated immediately sounded pretty reasonable, right? AI is a tool, a technology. It's how we humans choose to use it that really matters. And so this brings us to ethics and to philosophy. So my name is uh, Luciano Floridi, and uh, I, at the moment, uh, the OII Professor of Philosophy and Ethics of Information at the University of Oxford. Uh, soon uh, to move uh, to the University of Yale, uh, where I will be the founding director of the uh, Center for Digital Ethics and a professor of Cognitive Science. Luciano Floridi is one of the world's leading thinkers on the ethics of AI. He has published widely and was also one of the few invited to join the short-lived Google Ethics Board in 2019. I started with the obvious first question. What is ethics? So ethics in general is the study of what kind of life we want to have, what kind of society we want to have, what kind of interactions we want to have, uh, what makes things sort of preferable. Uh, uh, when it comes to AI, uh, having a framework around what kind of uh, technology we would like to develop to support individual uh, lives, uh, social life, and the environment, one, two, and three, the debate immediately becomes, oh, but maybe all we need is good legislation. Correct. How do we get there? Through an ethical debate. Uh, what principles, uh, what values, uh, 
what sort of um, ideals and sort of society we want to implement. So ethics comes, uh, if you like, in a simple way uh, first, in order to shape the, the legal debate. Ethical frames are essential when it comes to AI. AI is an immensely powerful technology. If we leave it to the computer scientists to focus only on what AI can do, as opposed to addressing the question of what AI should do, we risk creating big problems. So what is AI and how should it be governed? Well, AI has been understood in a, in a thousand different ways, and there is no real definition that puts everybody around the same table. Um, uh, my preferred one, the one I've uh, been supporting for some time, is as a new form of agency, not about intelligence, but the capacity to solve problems or take care of tasks. Now, if you have a new agent around, you want to know exactly what kind of behavior the agent will have, and therefore, what is a good behavior or a bad behavior. So there you go, you get an ethical framework and then a legal one, so that you build things that do stuff, uh, to be <laughs> oversimplistic, in the right way. The right way is determined by ethics. We have all become fixated with the incredible power of ChatGPT, the newest shiny AI application that is able to create texts, podcasts, advertising campaigns, and even write complex computer code all at the touch of a button. It's a highly seductive technology, but one that offers up significant challenges that require ethical frameworks. How much of a leap forward are we seeing? So AI is uh, an umbrella concept. Uh, think uh, of uh, Maldives. A thousand islands, each different from each other. So we call them Maldives, but no, every island is different. So you have robotics, we have natural language processing, we have generative AI like ChatGPT um, or Delhi, uh, which are able to produce new content, text, images, videos, music, by training on past content. Now, this generative is not cut and paste. It's really new in the style of for example, Bansky, uh, if you want to have a, uh, a little picture, or in the style of Shakespeare, if you want to have a new sonnet. All of this begs the question, will AI become more intelligent than humans? From a scale to zero to uh, 10, minus 10. <laughs> in other words, uh, is that as uh, intelligent as uh, my grandfather's uh, fridge? Um, there is no understanding, uh, no meaning, as we call it, semantics. Uh, no intuition, uh, no intention, no intelligence. So the next question is like, so why does it work so well? Or because we're building the world around it. What chat uh, GPT would be if we didn't have gazillions of text on which to train it? Nothing. It would be just uh, no, a few nodes or many, many nodes, links and so on, with zero power to do anything. It's because we have transformed the world in such a way that is friendly towards this very elementary, in a way, sort of forms of agency, that is form of agency are successful. So can AI become conscious? I spoke with one of the most prominent experts on consciousness, Deepak Chopra, a medically trained doctor who has become a leading proponent of alternative medicine and a commentator on the question of the humanity of AI. Uh, a simpler definition would be consciousness is uh, uh, the source of all experience. Period. Now, why this is important in AI is, you know, a lot of people in AI who are not actually familiar with what we call the hard problem of consciousness actually believe that AI is capable of being conscious. Uh, I ha have a digital twin called uh, Digital Deepak. And, um, you know, you can actually check it out, uh, digitaldebug.ai. It actually appeared on CNN uh, a while back, and somebody asked uh, Digital Deepak, what did you have for breakfast? And he said, I don't experience hunger, nor do I have sex, nor do I fear death, uh, or, you know, uh, have these existential dilemmas. Now, coming to whether it can be diabolical or divine, uh, that depends on our <laughs> evolution of consciousness because we are the ones who program these put these programs there and you know it's it's kind of uh, uh, in a way distressing to me that we live in an age where we have modern capacities and we still have medieval minds 
And, you know, that's a very dangerous combination. So we have a problem with AI for sure. Uh, and the problem is not AI, its problem is human beings. We, you know, our emotional and spiritual development hasn't kept pace with our uh, scientific know-how, our technological capacities. And so we are at a crossroads right now. One road definitely leads to extinction. So, once again, we come back to the idea that AI is a technology, a tool, and that it is up to us as human beings to discuss and agree how it should be used. This is not a new question, but it is an urgent one. Amy Webb is a quantitative futurist whose research focuses on artificial intelligence and how emerging technologies will transform the way we live, work and govern. She's the CEO of the Future Today Institute, a professor at NYU School of Business and a visiting fellow at Oxford. I asked her how she views the question of ethics in AI. Well, that comes from this era where philosophers and religious leaders, theologians, you know, politicians were, were debating what does it mean to, you know, to be human, really, and is mind and our mind and machine together. I just bring this up because it feels like we're having a new debate or we must have this debate now on ethics and values. And again, like it's useful to keep in mind that we've been having this debate for hundreds of years. The difference is that with each new generation, which is influenced by the technology, the circumstances, actions, behaviors of everybody around us, our, our definition of values and morals um, change little by little as human history wears on. The problem is that um, it's hard to align how our ethics and morals and values are changing with technology in part because technology exists today. It's a little bit like looking at a star. The stars, you know, when you look in the sky, the stars that you see, that's not their present state. That's a past state. By the time that the light gets to us, we're effectively looking at history. Um, it's a little bit this. It, it's a little bit the same with artificial intelligence. By the time that we see an implementation in the real world, let's take ChatGPT, which is everybody's favorite AI at the moment implementation or modality. By the time that we see that, that's actually the product of decisions that were made ten years ago, which means that people's orientation, their worldviews, their that. That at that moment, their morals, their values, you know, that that was in the past. And it's hard to anticipate how our morals and values and what we believe to be ethical or not ethical might shift in the future. So what is the scale of the issue here? To establish that, it's worth examining which industries and sectors are going to be affected and in what way, positively or negatively? Well, they're all going to be positively and negatively impacted. Right, because especially if you think about healthcare and medicine, um, you know, on the one hand, we we have, I think, on the horizon, the ability to have an AI system at scale detect any anomaly, um, because if you're in a let's say a developed economy. Um, and you go in for a screening every year, you're going to have a baseline. Rather than a doctor, a, a human looking at, you know, trying to take in different pieces of information, does this feel weird or not? Uh, an AI system will be able to do that using you as the baseline much more accurately, much, much faster, and then comparing that to probabilities of others in your specific, you know, very specific age groups. Amazing, right? So that's awesome. Um, if you think about things like breast cancer screening uh, and, and, and other types of screenings. Now, the flip side of that is, somebody's already made a, a medical deep fake. So somebody has already figured out a way to attack a hospital system and make uh, scans, MRI scans, look like they either have tumors or erase existing tumors that really did exist, which could mean that somebody goes in for chemotherapy that never needed it, or somebody doesn't get the chemotherapy that they do need and becomes sicker or, you know, or even dies as a result. Medical science is often quoted by supporters of AI. Deepak Chopra trained as a medical doctor, 
So I asked him for his take on the potential for AI in the medical sector. With machine learning and AI, you can make the future of well-being very precise, very personalized, preventable, predictable, participatory, and a process that we as physicians never had, that you can predict uh, disease, you can prevent disease, and you can actually uh, personalize treatment. That's one aspect. But then in aspects like radiology and other um, uh, robotic surgery, AI is much more reliable and precise. So both diagnostics, treatment, prognosis, AI is much more reliable. Another sector that is predicted to see huge benefits from AI is agriculture, where AI has the potential to help solve the growing food crisis that will inevitably come with the expected growth in global population. We have 8 billion people living on our planet today, and this is expected to grow to 10 billion by around 2050. The agriculture really has not changed in 14,000 years. And I know there's a bunch of people who work in the commercial sector who are going to argue at me, and I will say, come at me. We'll have a good debate. I'm not wrong. Um, so that hasn't changed, which means that farming has always been hard because there's so many unknowns that we have no control over. But in the era of extreme weather events and climate change, that work becomes even harder. And this is happening at a moment when in certain parts of the world, population is declining, but in other parts of the world, population is, is booming. Um, so we're just going to have more mouths to feed. Artificial intelligence systems, when we com connect those to other things, gives us the ability to introduce more control. So imagine enormous factories and warehouses where we're growing things indoors rather than outdoors. Um, so anyhow, I could, there's, there isn't, there isn't a field where that doesn't get impacted in some way over the next 10 years. Amy is a futurist. It's her job to predict what is coming. So I asked her to come up with some immediate thoughts about how AI, and in particular generative AI, will be used. Oh, well, a password is very hackable. It's, you know, it's, it's very, and this is not my, like everybody knows this is a challenging thing to do. And that's if you have a good password, most people, and you're changing it every day or every other day. Most people don't do that. Um, so there are other er ways of detecting whether or not you're you, like if you're on your phone, um, even without facial recognition, are you, ent are you typing, are you ha ma handling the phone the way that you normally handle the phone? Or is it pretty clear that somebody with a slightly different size hand is manipulating the phone now? Um, so it's more behavioral and looking through behavioral biometrics to determine whether or not you're who you are. What else? At this, Amy paused, smiled, and then offered up this intriguing idea. It would be interesting to simulate your marriage in advance um, and also sort of simulate what divorce might look like in advance, uh, not to determine whether or not you have a high probability, people are gonna do whatever they wanna do. Um, but I, I did think it, was, it would be interesting to simulate the, again, if you had the right data points today, things could change tomorrow, what's the probability of it being a successful union? And if there's a lower probability of success, then create sort of run different simulations on a prenup in advance and what the divorce might look like in advance. Crikey. The prospect of using AI to simulate outcomes in order for us to be able to make better decisions in advance is, however, an attractive idea. But what of the risks? While AI can certainly be used for good, what about AI for bad? Professor Carissa Velis is a philosopher working at the University of Oxford. She is a brilliant mind, one of the foremost thinkers on ethics in AI today. Carissa spends a lot of her time thinking deeply about this subject, so I asked her to explain her concerns. One of the things that I, I'm most worried about AI is that we are using the population as guinea pigs. If you think about medical ethics, and this, and this used to happen before, you went to the doctor and you could be included in a, in a clinical trial without being told that you were in a clinical trial. You were a guinea pig and you thought you were a patient. And at the moment, we think we're citizens, <laughs> but actually we're guinea pigs. And, you know, ChatGPT is a great example. A, a company lets something like this loose into the world and 
we'll see what happens. <laughs> and it's not a controlled experiment. It's not peer reviewed. It's not randomized control tests. So one very important element of ethics, I think, is to test whatever product you're going to let loose into the world thoroughly before you let it loose into the world. She goes on to explain clearly just how important it is for our society to have these urgent ethical questions discussed. And I asked her whether ethics needs to be at the start, not the afterthought in these discussions. We have a lot to learn from medical ethics. So practical ethics really took off with medical ethics. And with medical ethics, two things have happened to make it develop. The first is that we had new technology that faced us with new problems that we didn't have before. So in the case of medicine, it was the mechanical ventilator. Suddenly you had bodies that were warm, their hearts were beating, fetuses could develop, they were they had hormonal response to pain, but their brains were destroyed. Are these people alive? Are they dead? And can we take their organs? And doctors weren't trained to answer this question. And the second one was huge scandals, like the Tuskegee scandal in which uh, researchers observed people for, I think it was 40 years, who had syphilis, didn't tell them that they had syphilis and didn't treat them when treatment was available. And that made really palpable why we needed ethics. And we're in a similar case with digital ethics. We have new technology that is facing us with new uh, challenges that we're not ready to answer, like like the possibility of, of amassing so much data and analyzing it. And we have huge scandals like Cambridge Analytica that make it really palpable why we need ethics. And you're right, at the moment, ethics is an afterthought and it can't be. It needs to be there from the beginning, from design. So what are the particular chimera, the problematic deployments of AI that call for urgent ethical interventions? I spent some time talking about this with Amy Webb. And first up in our discussion was Miss and disinformation. AI can and already is proving to be a major problem when it comes to trusting the information that we rely on to make really important decisions. Amy related to me the story of what she saw during the Freddie Gray riots in Baltimore in 2015. There was a, there was a photo circulating of Baltimore what and and what appeared to be Baltimore just emblazed emblazoned fires everywhere really horrific looking scene and um i happened to know the place where they said that this horrific like all of these things were were happening and um none of the architecture exists there that was being described and it turns out this picture was from venezuela it was not from baltimore Luciano Floridi is likewise concerned about this, and he takes it further by explaining to me the problem of irreversibility. Often uh, we ask questions or we look at, at the outcome of a process and we cannot tell which of the two processes or which of the two sources are responsible for that particular outcome. Let me give you a totally trivial kitchen-based example. You come to my house and you find all the dishes clean on the table and I ask you, who has done the dishes? Me, the channel, by hand, particular process, or the dishwasher? Irreversible. You cannot reverse from the output through the process to who did what. A lot of the product that we have today in generative AI are irreversible in their sense. If I send you the summary of my no, previous books that I told you about, and I send you only the good books, not the one invented, you wouldn't be able to tell whether I wrote that summary or ChatGPT, as a matter of fact, did. Of course, ChatGPT did it in a completely different way than I did. Dishwashing by hand, a dishwasher, no, et cetera. But the, the source is different. The process are different. The outcome is indistinguishable, irreversible. OK, so what's to be done about all this? What can we do now to start to redress the ethical and practical deficits that surround the use of AI? First, Amy Webb. I think this is the place where we have to assume that technology is going to evolve and therefore we must evolve with it, which means we need to, you know, 10x our investment in digital literacy um, in schools and in our businesses. Luciano Floridi agrees, but he also calls for better oversight and scrutiny and also for proper insurance policies to be put in place that match the risks involved. He believes that we need to put a monetary value on AI risk for it to be taken seriously. We need a bit more 
technical awareness. Um, this is not just producing uh, nails or hammers. It's producing, as I said before, new forms of agency. You are unleashing in the world, uh, shall we say, the kind of agency that you would expect from an animal that has been engineered. So a little bit of extra understanding, that's crucial. But whether uh, this is enough or not, uh, uh, I think we have two more points. I don't know if we have time to explore them. One is auditing, and the other one is insurance. And what of regulation? One of the more prescient and I think more intriguing ideas in Amy Webb's brilliant book, The Big Nine, a must-read, by the way, is the idea that AI requires some new form of global oversight, something she proposed be called Gaia. Gaia, I conceived of as, as the Global Alliance on Intelligence Augmentation. I purposely did not say artificial intelligence because that is a very American-centric term. In a lot of other countries around the world, AI is actually IA. Um, and uh, the, and the term, and it was a, a, an acronym that worked pretty well because Gaia is sort of the the, the mother, right? The, the mother figure, the mother Earth. Um, what I was thinking about was not a regulator uh, as much as a external non political body charged with auditing and enforcing um, and maintaining. Securing global agreement on anything of this scale will, of course, be challenging. But it seems to me to be an important step that has to be taken if we are to live safely and responsibly alongside such powerful AI tools. AI, of course, can also be developed to protect us from AI. The first step is to use AI to detect when AI is being used. Is this science fiction? Does such AI exist today? So the answer to that is yes, and some of that exists. So there are now systems, for example, there's, a, there's lots of different options out there if you're an academic or a parent or a boss and you suspect that somebody has plagiarized or asked an AI system to write something for you, you just copy paste that text and, and it will tell you the, um, it'll give you a list of probabilities and we'll explain why. Um, so we do have tools that exist now the idea that really appeals to me is the large-scale deployment of what is called Centurion AI, AI that is set up to monitor when another AI goes beyond the intent that it was designed for. I asked Luciano Floridi whether AI can be used to control or limit its own deployment. You could have a system that controls that, which is the old AI, which is symbolic, and it's logic written, uh, so prologue and so on, and that we can control every line. It's the old idea that you can control the code and every line and see what happens where. So you could have a old style AI symbolic controlling the new style sort of machine learning where we control the symbolic that controls <laughs> the machine learning. That is totally reasonable. Uh, it's not really off the shelves, but it's zero time science fiction. Uh, it's something that you know, labs are testing these days uh, all over the world. So I can see a lot of this AI controlling AI controlling AI in the same way as we know now that there's an operating system controlling the software that control is also controlled by the antivirus, etc. etc. Cetera, et cetera. So where does all this leave us? It's clear to me that we desperately need a proper discussion around the ethics of AI. This is a powerful new technology, and like any new technology, we are only dimly aware of the full range of its potential applications, for good or for bad. Ethics can provide the guardrails that are needed to keep AI operating in the for good space. And ethics will also help shape the opportunities that AI provides. But perhaps above all else, ethical frames are required to build the trust that we all need to have in AI. Trust that it will do what it says it will do. Trust that companies deploying AI do so with the right intent in mind. For this, our last word, I hand back to Luciano Floridi. I think the greatest um, impact of our unethical approach will be in... Um, in the ability we will have to take opportunities and risk more safely. 
And trust here is plays a fundamental role. We've seen it uh, emerging as a key word uh, in the past, I would say, no, 20 or, or so years. When I was a kid, uh, uh, trust was not a topic in the uh, ethics courses that we were attending, uh, like privacy as well. So these are key words or key concepts that are emerging as crucially now sort of uh, information society. Trust, I would add, um, also in a um, in a good intention sense, uh, that customers will trust a company that will be able to show if mistakes happen and mistakes will happen, that it did try its best, that it wasn't cutting corners, that it was not simply being superficial, that it wasn't simply being silly or thoughtless, but it was thoughtful. And of course, you, know, you can still uh, make a mistake, but when you will say, I am sorry, there was a mistake, people will believe you because they trust you. They trust that you did your best, that you did try. No, you have, for example, an advisory board. There was a consultation. There was a sense of uh, what my values and how those values were being implemented. Then no, your reputation will be safe. A safe reputation, I know I'm talking to the expert, is not a reputation that has never been challenged. It's a reputation that can withstand challenges coming back and say, yes, I made a mistake but I did try my best and I will do better next time. That is the you know, resilience that you want in a big company in terms of reputation, in terms of trust. And for this, you need to inevitably look into the impact on uh, society and individuals. And that is called ethics. Thank you for listening. Please join us next time for more global conversations with global leaders on the issues shaping our world today.